today's two sessions with Tian Wei. On International Women's Day, get up close and personal with a fine female from Hong Kong and Macau, who made inroads as a businesswoman in modern China. Meet Fancy Ho Shou King. Now women having the capability to uh, advance into their own career developments um, in different sectors and also um, areas. Actions speak louder than words. During China's annual political season this year, I want to take you to meet them who believe in the greater good and who practice what they preach. Join me two sessions with Tian Wei on World Insight. Hello, I'm Tian Wei, and welcome to our special series, Two Sessions with Tian Wei, which features interviews with outstanding figures attending the two sessions during China's annual political season. Women hold up half of the sky, that is for sure. And that is fabulous that you and I are interacting with outstanding women every day who make our world better. March the 8th marks the International Women's Day celebrating the social, economic, and the political achievements of women across the world. Well, it is also a great opportunity to find out how women have been contributing to what China is today. I wish I could have the opportunity to talk to all the outstanding women of China, but today at least let's meet one of them. Pansy Ho Chiu King, a prominent businesswoman based in Hong Kong and Macau, considered one of the most influential women figures from Asia. Ms. Ho, what a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Mine too. Um, and we have been meeting up in many different places, but you know, back in Beijing, it's very exciting. It is. I'm looking forward to a day to see you face to face once again. But you know, today is the International Women's Day. So I want to say uh, congratulations and happy International Women's Day to you. Thank you. This is an extremely meaningful uh, Women's Day for me indeed. Mm. This is your first time as the CPPCC member, isn't it? Indeed. Uh, this is the first time uh, that I am the National Congress uh, level CCPCC. Uh, I have already actually been a uh, Beijing CCPCC member for 15 years. But uh, of course, this would be a major uh, leapfrog into a new era of representing, you know, the national level interests and uh, issues. And of course, on the International Women's Day, we working women are all working today. <laughs> exactly. Well, maybe that's the way how we celebrate best, mm -hmm. you know, our, our, <laughs> our way of celebrating uh, International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. Celebrate life and also celebrate the time we, in which we are in. Is there some uh, things that you want to share with your peers, with women, here in China and around the world about, you know, how to be, uh, you know, a strong and uh, also a capable woman in today's uh, ever-changing world. Is there something you want to share? Well, I think all women are born already and bred to be strong, in fact, because we usually will have, you know, dual or even multiple roles in our lives. Now women having the capability to uh, advance into their own career developments um, in different sectors and also um, areas. And so in the end, of course, women will also choose to become uh, one day uh, housewives and mothers. So I think, you know, we are accustomed to having multiple roles and uh, responsibilities. So we, I think in essence, women actually are the busiest kind of people, you know, we, we work all the time, we multitask all the time. <laughs> Actions speak louder than words. During China's annual political season this year, I want to take you to meet them who believe in the greater good and who practice what they preach. Join me two sessions with Tian Wei on World Insight. Speaking at a CPPCC event this week, Pansy Ho said she comes from the Greater Bay Area and she hopes that the Hong Kong can act as a bridge linking the Greater Bay Area with the world. 
as China sets a GDP growth target of around 5% for the year 2023, there is a new impetus for the Greater Bay Area to deliver high-quality development. Having said that, let me move on to the political agenda for this year's uh, two sessions. Uh, one of the things that China has set for itself, also illustrated in the annual government work report, is the annual growth rate around 5%. Now, to you, both the businesswomen and someone who has been working on the tourism sector for years, what does that mean for Chinese economy and also for the rest of the world, you think? I think this is a very um, realistic projection, uh, but yet still very ambitious, of course. Look around ourselves and, you know, with other countries in the world, everybody is still uh, in a way suffering or having uh, some sort of influence or effects from the three-year COVID uh, kind of hit on the economy. Uh, many would have to still be able to uh, return to a more normal economic cycle and be hopefully able to also um, control and contain inflation and also to be able to increase employment. I think in all what we have heard from the Prime Minister and, uh, the, and, and uh, our government is that they are looking for a more steady and also gradual growth instead of just really basically you know, putting in a lot of measures to bump up the economy, so to speak. In fact, because China is such a big country, we would like to take things in a more um, kind of a short and also uh, well-managed way. So although it is set at 5%, and which is a very high uh, ratio, I believe, uh, I think it is ultimately achievable simply because if we read through the whole document, um, it, it comes up with a lot of rationale and also uh, different methodologies to demonstrate how, in fact, step by step, they are honing in on those areas where they believe will become the economic drivers. There's also a clear indication on how there is a, a very um, clear uh, direction on increasing in employment um, in the next year. And there's also obviously the uh, ability to continue working with other countries uh, in order to help to stimulate more direct investments and also to continue on with the, um, uh, the, the One Belt, One Road initiative, which could also help to propel the mm -hmm. kind of economic development mm -hmm. for both ourselves and also you know, our uh, strategic partners. When talking to you, Ms. Ho, of course, one would naturally think about the economy in Hong Kong and also uh, the economy of Macau. Now, uh, you said that earlier during the two sessions that you your, consider yourself as a great bear. Uh, I guess that's a terminology that you invented to yourself, uh, um, meaning that you are keen on the development of the Greater Bay Area, uh, which is in the southern part of China, bringing in a lot of vibrant cities, including Hong Kong and Macau uh, as a whole. So tell me more about what do you expect when the national plan is around 5%, what does that mean for the Greater Bay Area? Well, the Greater Bay Area as it is, which is comprising of 11 cities, including Hong Kong and Macau, uh, together with nine other cities within the Guangdong province, um, are actually all sharing very common roots and culture from thousands of years ago. Um, so it is natural that we could craft a very you know, close assimilation and collaboration to go into the future development of the whole region, representing something like, you know, 12.6 trillion in uh, renminbi uh, economic output for 2021. And it is a place with a population base of over 86 million. Uh, in fact, this is not really entirely uh, a new idea. This has been evolving from what in the past we used to be uh, actually calling it the uh, Pearl River Delta. The Greater Bay Area represents already now one third of uh, the kind of GDP of uh, 
China, and it is also basically uh, attracting a lot of foreign direct investments due to the fact that within the 11 cities, we have Shenzhen, we have Tianhai, uh, which are now the cradle for technology uh, and advanced uh, information and advanced reality developments. And we have, of course, Hong Kong being of course already the uh, metropolitan uh, city, which is the key financial gateway and also, you know, the major uh, kind of shipping uh, and, and also now uh, aviation hub for the whole of southern China. Mm -hmm. We have also Zhuhai and Macau and, and obviously also um, Hengqing, which is immediately next to Macau and becoming a back kind of a garden where there will be more collaboration in the future between Macau and Hengqing, uh, hoping to develop into a more holistic and comprehensive tourism destination. Uh, offering uh, the host of different um, non-gaming op uh, offerings as well. So, and, and this is not to even say that we have Guangzhou, clearly, and also some of the key manufacturing bases around the Guangdong province. So here we are, we have everything from the, from the, from the base to the even uh, kind of very uh, top level in terms of the various uh, capabilities, logistics, infrastructures that are all already put in place. We, this whole area has been a beneficiary for the, uh, the, the country's uh, opening up of its economy uh, during the past 40 years. So we actually can see a lot of cross-germination of new industry sectors. We see that there have been already established uh, co good collaboration we now have a lot of Hong Kong companies that are putting their bases also into these cities and vice versa. So I believe this is not even just a, an idea. This, this is obviously uh, a, a major national campaign championed by our own uh, President Xi, uh, simply because he has a mm -hmm. very strong understanding of the capabilities of the southern China uh, region. And now I think this is the right timing to do it. Yeah, I can tell Ms. Ho the excitement in your eyes and also, you know, the uh, smooth ideas that are keep on coming out when you're talking about the Greater Bay Area. But there are issues that, uh, you know, those who are building the Greater Bay has to deal with. For example, the bottlenecks. Uh, there were a lot of discussions about that, how to smooth up the bottlenecks to make it efficiently work and also be able to make sure the systems of one city or one place might be matching uh, with those of the others uh, so that it would eventually work as one. How is that process going on right now? As a business leader, uh, what do you see is the most important component to make that process work? Well, um, of course, there's a tendency that you know people nowadays uh, would always uh, push some of the delays in development to uh, the COVID influence. In this case, in a way, it is not an excuse. It is even actually a reality that we had to suffer. But I think now that we can reopen the borders and we can see immediately, in fact, uh, many of these cross in interactions are already taking place. And uh, well, I'm here in Beijing, but I know of my own calendar in less than a week time, it, when I return to Hong Kong mm -hmm. and Macau, I have already my whole itinerary filled with all sorts of visits and also um, uh, delegates coming from different parts of the Bay Area <laughs> uh, to come and start to already you know, ignite and initiate talks about you know, concrete uh, activities and uh, developments together. Um, the governments, naturally, uh, who mm -hmm. are also in place to put together some uh, real game plan in order to pour our resources, we'll have to sit down and there is already crafted a system where uh, there's a, um, you know, kind of regular meeting, meetup that they can put together and, and basically uh, iron out all these uh, issues. Um, from, the, from the private sector side, as I had mentioned, actually, there has been not really a major deterrent, so to speak, about the interest for 
people who understand from their own development needs that they themselves will be, you know, obviously seeking opportunities uh, in many of these areas. For instance, with Nan Shah, uh, we have a obviously our uh, immediate past chief executive, uh, Mr. C. Uh, y. Lang, basically put forward and now have already seen some success in building schools, um, in championing for uh, getting more uh, kind of cross-border collaboration in different uh, scientific or uh, research areas, bringing together uh, professionals mm -hmm. uh, who can start think tanks and who can actually start to review and investigate on how best to resolving some of these issues. Um, we have obviously between Macau and Hengting, I spoke about earlier. In fact, um, the, the uh, creation of a joint kind of uh, development bureau had already been put forth, and mm. it, if it weren't for COVID, actually uh, the chief executive of Macau and the uh, mayor of Guangdong province were to actually sit together and come up with and draw up a, a blueprint uh, for the development for Hengting and Macau mm -hmm. together. Ms. Ho, if I remember right, you earlier pledged to uh, invest even uh, 2.2 billion more dollars into the whole project of the Greater Bay. How do you see that investment could be spent uh, efficiently? The 2.2 billion US dollars that I was mentioning was predominantly still going to go back to Macau because that was following on the uh, new awarding of uh, concessions, uh, but requiring that in this new era or the new decade upcoming, that there has to be commitment to investing in all the non-gaming areas and sectors. So that right. was uh, what mm -hmm. I had alluded to, which was a really big demonstration of our faith and also um, you know, continued interest in staying in Macau and doing more. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that does not indeed negate the the thought or the p potential that because and due to our confidence in Macau, we will definitely also want to see how Macau can become successfully helping to pull together synergies with other cities in the Greater Bay Area and creating what I had mentioned earlier, a bigger tourism itinerary, uh, which is coming to you know, mm. the same region, but visiting the various cities for different experiences. So along that, there is a good chance mm. still that, you know, even beyond or outside of my Mac Macau investment, that from my Hong Kong companies uh, and Macau companies, that we are also concurrently looking at investing in different cities in the Greater Bay Area so that we can create, mm -hmm. again, you know, that network or that uh, basically platform so that in the future there will be uh, one day the materialization of what I had just mentioned about Tourism Plus. Uh, Ms. Ho, how do you see uh, the fact that uh, Macau is on its way to diversify its industries, earlier gaming industry, the majority of course, but now in the future, do you see Macau will move away from gaming industry and more focusing on you know, exhibitions, meetings, conferences, tourism, rather than gaming. What does that mean for your uh, core business? I don't believe that they are actually um, counterproductive to each other. Having the gaming aspect still being maintained, but not taking up, you know, the center role or basically using up all of our resources, both financially as well as, you know, the mm. human talents, which was predominantly what had happened in the first phase of the uh, gaming regime. I think now we see that we are more mature. Mm -hmm. we, well, from where we had started 20 years ago, when the first concessions were granted under the uh, special administrative region, we were talking about, and I know better than most, because in those days, the monopoly gaming operator was, of course, my family's company. With the return of sovereignty, mm -hmm. the opening up of the borders, the ability of attracting new investors, and for them to also bring more and more of the various sort of uh, interesting offerings 
whether it is in mice, in entertainment, in arts and culture, in gastronomy, um, and even now we're talking about really organizing mega events and sport events. Uh, we, we, we see already that during the past two decades, we were able to now raise the total visitation from some three plus million to uh, we were almost at 40 million by 2019. So it's a wow. tenfold leap, wow. simply just because we now have a bigger marketplace and we have now actually even more efficient infrastructure. So imagine, we now have the, yeah. the Hong Kong, Macau, Zhuhai Bridge that could link immediately, you know, the three cities. And we can capture traffic from five international airports around us, which have a total throughput of over 200 million a year. So the, the, the potential really is, you know, significant and limitless. And we have now committed right. to investing this amount of money in order to capture also international travelers, at least regional arrivals, which is very, very plausible. And we have already seen the trend growing. So I think this is all going to actually be making sense. And that's why I think Macau is now at a point of maturity with a lot more understanding mm -hmm. about what the customers require and need, and also how to, like I said earlier, work together with our uh, partnering mm -hmm. cities in order to create a more interesting and long stay itinerary. It sounds extremely exciting what you have just said, Ms. Ho. However, on the other hand, we have seen the world is changing dramatically. If you compare now to the year 2019 before the pandemic, we see geopolitics, we see things are getting ever more complicated in terms of China's external growth environment. So um, how do you as a seasoned business person looking at the reality and think about domestic consumption vis-a-vis -vis international interactions? You know, where would you put most of your strengths and what would that mean for your um, earlier ways of doing business? Well, the world keeps changing. Um, whether it is changing for better or worse, you know, it will come around and it will also go away. So what we are really wanting to do is that we want to be well prepared. So it is true, in the immediate term, maybe uh, we would be still in the upcoming months, we would still have to focus back on our domestic market because even our domestic market has not actually mm -hmm. been all recovered uh, since COVID. Um, and, we, and we have to focus on the deliverable of all these new investments and uh, non-gaming products that we need to go into to, to build mm -hmm. and to basically you know, work on. Um, I think, and then we will work on a more holistic and basically more strategic game plan in terms of reviewing and evaluating which are going to be actually more valuable markets for our type of business or our type of um, uh, kind of situation. Um, in the immediate term, in mm -hmm. any case, I think the regional uh, kind of markets are going to be very robust. We can focus on uh, what we can do best and go to Southeast Asia uh, cities and countries. And, and as you can see, we mm. already are very active also working along and together with the Middle Eastern countries. So I think within, mm -hmm. you know, a, a manageable type of kind of uh, development plan, we can nurture our own capability. We need to be really Mm -hmm. thorough in terms of our own investigation on exactly what the customers today want. I'm very convicted and convinced that when we have the capability of showcasing uh, China's own ability and um, its own kind of also yearning to demonstrate our own creativity, mm -hmm. uh, innovation, that those are the real uh, products that we can actually bring the visitors to come. That is in the making. 
at the uh, latest uh, annual presser by the Chinese foreign minister, Qian Gang, he talked about narrative traps these days that people uh, witnessed in the world about the issues related to China, namely, you know, uh, things have been misinterpreted uh, and also being put into rhetorical ways that are so far away from reality. That's in his words, of course. So now to you as a business person and an international one, how do you see the reality? And for business, how do you fit into and trying to shape the reality? China is going through a very difficult uh, situation because there's so much China actually can show, well, except if it falls on, you know, not the interested ears, then they are not helping and they yeah. are not also making their own effort to discover. Now, it's then become our job as a, you know, a private sector person, but a private sector person who has got a lot of um, com conviction and patriotism for my, com for my country. You know, I have always believed in and I have de dedicated and devoted my own time and my own abilities and building networks in order to precisely do that. Um, it is not always easy mm -hmm. for the country to just, you know, tell people that we are capable of doing all these things if, you know, there's not really the right avenue. Well, we are the entrepreneurs. We can make friends. We can make money, you know, together with people who have like minds. And this is our duty. We need to be out there in the international scene. We need to be telling people what we're just doing. Put maybe sometimes politics or ideology aside. We just look at the reality and we just talk about people. Because in the end, we all need to care for people. Mm. Ms. Ho, it's such a pleasure talking to you. I'm sure our conversation will continue for the coming months and years. Really appreciate it and happy International Women's Day to you. Thank you very much.